like to put you right into our panel because we definitely need to talk more, more about connected and automated transportation. So Taco, please feel free to take the second chair from yeah. over there. We also ask Augustine to join us back on stage. And we welcome to the round new Doug Brown, head of Europe Flexport. Doug has been working in logistics for 17 years at both logistics providers and ocean carriers, gaining experience in both domestic and international supply chain management. Welcome to the stage. Doug, you take well, the first, Taco right. the second, Augustine yeah. the third. It's not that I don't remember three faces, it's just to make sure that the names behind you fits you. So, perfect. Thank you so much for having you all in the round. As Augustine Taco already had the chance to talk a little bit. Doug, I would love to give you a minute just to introduce yourself a little sure. bit and maybe also what Flexport is doing. Yeah. Just so to get to know you a bit better. Thank you. Yeah, no, great to be here. My name is Doug Brown. I'm the head of Europe for Flexport. Flexport's a nine-year-old um, digital freight forwarder that basically we've developed and operate our own cloud-based platform to move goods. So in terms of mobility, we're more in moving uh, cargo than people, which is a little bit different, I think, from, uh, from what Augustine was talking about, but probably more similar to, to Taco Sphere. Perfect. It's a pleasure to have you on that Thank round. You. As you are all new today, and maybe some of you as well, let's explain how our panels work this year. We have decided to, to slightly change it a little bit. So I have prepared four topics for you, but unfortunately in 20 minutes you can imagine we just have time for one or two. So we have invented our wheel of topic. It's kind of the wheel of fortune you know from Jimmy Fallon maybe. And we check out, in Germany we say also Glücksrad. We have Glücksrad. Let's check out which topics our wheel of topic chooses for you first, and then we will focus on these two topics. I just need to have a look at my cards. So first one will be Digitizing operation, a preventer for crisis. And the sec on the second one, the future of logistic. And the question if it's a booster for sustainability. OK, then let's start with digitizing operations, a preventer for crisis. Well, <laughs> the crystal ball of operations, let's <laughs> call it that way. Do digitized processes enable you to predict scenarios before they happen? You say yes, Doug. Oh, no. sorry. Um, <laughs> I didn't know you were addressing it to me, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, look, there's, if, if we look in my sphere of influence, which is really moving cargo internationally, I think the last two, three years is kind of, no one can predict really what's going to happen. You name it, we've experienced it. And can it can it ask actually can can data actually allow you to predict a crisis? No, but I think history is also a good teacher. And I think when you actually structure this data and you can look back, you have that to uh, to actually refer to. But if you actually look at the way we in Flexport, the way we actually create the use of data, is is allowing people to make decisions faster. So I think in in the world that we live in now, if you look at what we've experienced over the last three years, you. If you, I mean, the, the name of this topic in terms of paper versus digital, right? If you, if you can empower people frontline with data to make decisions in real time, you can definitely adjust to these crises quicker than competition. I think that's, that's the real critical factor. So data is, structuring data and bringing it together is step number one. And then I think that allows you to trust the frontline user to, to make those decisions. So that's how I would answer that question. Taka, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think, I think that's very much it. I think they're, uh, we focus always on preparing on the crisis. And uh, what we've seen, for example, with the first uh, corona waves, we joined up with one of our core competitors to make a monitor uh, showing actually per industry type how much traffic there was, right? And we saw actually the traffic jumping. Well, Germany was actually kept it quite high. Spain, there was a big big deep and uh, they, they rely a lot on, on uh, for example, on people, transport, buses, uh, tourist industry. But also what we saw is that at one point you see it actually going up again. So I think also you should look at the positive part. It's not just preparing, let's say, for, for the crisis that is up to come, but it's also actually when do we feel the first signs mm. that the crisis is actually dissolving? When can I start reinvesting again? Mm. And actually what we saw is that at one point you see certain areas, certain countries picking up again. We also saw the one coming in Germany where uh, I think it was the beginning of last year, but nobody really expected that. Then, hey, suddenly there was a dip there. So you, you can see it and you can actually use, if you find the right things, you can use it also to already see if, if things are getting better or, or not. So if all the data, it's, it's like a warning, like lamp. You know, you, you can avoid it, but you can see it coming maybe earlier. 
Yeah. That's what you are saying, right? Yeah, I think when a, a crisis is usually by default, it's, it's an emergency. It's something you didn't see coming. So data, again, going to uh, the data at the front line, I think yours is a lot more positive. Maybe I'm, I'm taking the pessimistic approach, but when you see that happening, you, you, can, you can adjust to that. And the same thing when you see that, oh, maybe it's declining as well. I think um, in our sphere of influence, it's more, um, you know, where is um, port congestion has been a big issue. It's something that's come into the public eye in the past two years, right? So to your point, seeing early that, oh, actually, well, there isn't a delay at this port. There isn't a 20-day de delay to get to the vessel. You can actually do it in 10 days. Then we, we can even direct our workforce to, to, to look at that. So that's... Yeah, that's uh, exactly the same, same point. So that's what my next question would have been about. So <laughs> let's, let's pretend we are in the crisis already. Um, having all these data uh, collected and analyzed it, and um, it gives us the opportunity to react faster. It's not just putting you in the first row to see everything going downhill. Yeah. It also gives you the opportunity to react faster, right? Yeah. No, exactly. I think that's it. Like you, yeah, to your point, that, that if you're in the... Those, those key words are the front seat, right? If, you're in, if you can see it first and you're empowered to react, I think one thing we've seen in, in uh, so for Flexport at its core, we're trying to disrupt a basically a quite a traditional industry. And I think a traditional industry with a lack of data doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for that frontline employee to be trusted to make that decision. And then to your point, I think you gave a really good example of the, the memo, right? You, you, six, six hours for you to even get your thoughts to someone and then, yeah. I don't know, another week for someone to act on it. If you can have that data and you give that data and that trust to the frontline employee, to your point as well, I really like that on what does it mean for the employee, then you allow them, you trust them, you, you, you put all of that, you, you, you're much more agile service provider than in the old world where you, you have to wait six hours, 10 hours, one week to make a decision. That leads me directly to the next question from all of your different perspectives. Uh, who can digitize processes? And at the end of the day, who is in, who's in charge and who is in control? Who wants to start? I can start. So I think um, yeah, like the, the entities that look at their value chain, they can start uh, digitizing their processes and see, OK, and there they have the full power of uh, optimizing like, their internal stuff. But I think it's also important then to go the next step and look at the, the like steps in the value chain before and also after to digitize this as well. And then I think that the key part is to bring everything together, as Doug mentioned, mm -hmm. um, so that, uh, I mean, data is just one part, but you need to synchronize them, put them together in, in one data lake or one uh, data warehouse, enable the people then to, to work with it. Um, I think that's, um, that's how like, you can, can attack or like, uh, challenge uh, or find a solution for this challenge. Yeah. I, th I think you need to um, really look at what the benefits are of, of the data and who benefits from it. So I already mentioned the point that the starting point, one of the starting points are the employees. See how you can actually find and improve their, their work, their daily, uh, daily uh, tasks. Um, but what you see very often in companies is that there's different departments with different objectives, right? And one department, is usually some, the, the person that starts there and they come with the digitization and, and all the kind of systems that they want to build around that, very often driven together with IT, but they have their point of view. Mm. And, and you need to find the point of view with the others because very often the real benefits are somewhere else, right? So if you, for example, uh, digitize uh, the whole environment around the vehicle, right? You can probably reduce your cost, your fuel cost. That is one view. But the other view is actually that you improve your productivity of the vehicle. You can do more jobs. You need to plan that. You can, you can actually extend much more. And the funny thing of doing more jobs is actually you probably also use more fuel. It's not maybe necessarily better for the, for the environment. But it's a different fuel, and I think there's always a challenge. You need to find all the different stakeholders in your company uh, uh, to make it happen. But for me still, and that was my point, is the employee, if you don't find it for them, you will not be successful. And I think you need to take the employees with you and explain them the benefits and so on. Exactly. So based on my experience, they often feel like fears, OK, my job will be gone if you digitize the services. Mm -hmm. But you explain them the benefits and how like, their situation is improving. I think that's also like a crucial Absolutely. part then, of the digitalization. Mm -hmm. Doug, you want to add something? No, I, I, just think, I, th I think I agree with everything that was said. I think um, on, from the employee perspective, a good e I think a, good, a good, good example of this that a lot of companies have gone through, there's multiple companies in the world now and, and even ones that I've worked for that have this mantra, 
let's say for Salesforce, right? Did you can, adopting a soft, that's a very primitive example of adopting a software where a lot of companies will say, hey, if it's not in Salesforce, it doesn't exist. And that's a very top down, it's not a very motivating direction to your point. But then when you say, well, why, why, why do you do that? So people can plan demand, people can forecast from it. So then the finance, everyone has a buy-in from it. So you do digital adoption is the, you know, digital adoption of other software or a process, it needs to be sold to the employee of what, why do you have to do that? And to your yeah. point, if we take the internal company example, you, you really have to find what that means for, for everyone. Um, and I think if I take a, that's more an internal example, an ex external example with the Flexport, where we have a cloud-based platform, we're trying to connect parties. So we're, what we're actually trying to do is, what we actually admit to is say, well, the supply chain has a lot of different data. We're just gonna ingest it and try and structure it so that it's useful for you as a finance manager, you as a procurement manager, you as a logistics manager. And it's really structuring data and then, for want of a better word, selling it to that individual user. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, at the end, we are all with Taco. It's not only important that we see the benefit for the employees, yeah. it's important that the employee sees the benefit for the employee. Yeah. Perfect. So, I don't think anybody in this room is new when it comes to digitalization, but as you are all very, very much experienced, I would like to ask that question. Where do I start? I mean, what do I need and where do I start when I have a company and I want to start digitized processes? Your tips. Uh, Paco, go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think, and I've, I've seen, for example, with customers, how, how do they do that, right? And the successful ones. Um, and of course, there's all big projects and you do all those kind of things and, and where to start. Um, you need to have an idea, you need to have a, f f and it, it sounds like obvious, right? We all will do it, but you need to, you, not everybody does it. You need to have an idea why you do it. You need to find a vision. It's, it's not just because the governments tell you that or because I cannot get, for example, electrical vehicles. I cannot buy electrical vehicles anymore that I'm going to introduce those. No. So you need to have your own view as well. It's not just the environment that's pushing you towards that. And then another very important part is y you need to start testing. And you need to look at, um, uh, again, your, your employees and, and the most successful, and they do that. So they go actually with long tests with employees, find, find their feedback and see how actually, uh, what, what works best for them and, and how have, have the dialogue with them. How can we make this successful in our company? And it also means that you need to have time. And that's usually where any management, uh, and I know it's also from our own company, Time is, is very scarce, so we're always, we want to do it fast because we've seen all those great technologies that had so much quick adoption in, in the world, right? I mean, I mean, when was this first smartphone that came out, right? It was still this century, I mean, it was 10, 15 years ago when I think the first iPhones came out and it went so fast. So everybody's expecting we need to be fast and we have to do it fast. But sometimes we forget that before the introduction of such a thing, there was a lot of failure. So there was failure before the first iPhone came out. And there were a lot of companies that tested it a lot. So it's not that that was the first moment. No, before that, a lot of other things happened that nobody sees. And I think that's also what we need to accept in a company, that uh, you, you need to go for it, you need to do it, you need to continue doing it, you need to build your vision, and you need to probably be prepared that it will not go very smoothly and there will be some, some barriers and some, some failures there as well. Absolutely. Doug, you want to add something? Yeah, I think um, I'm trying to think of an example where if you, if you talk about digitization, let's say internally, it's, m it's usually about asking a large group of people to adopt a new s data or a new process. I think a few things we've learned is, um, I think every company's gone through this, is making sure you test it before you actually roll it out. Because one failure you can maybe overcome, two rollouts, people will start to question that. So you, Especially, it's easier in a company like ours, which is a startup where you you have that mentality to change. But I think if you're looking at a 100-year-old company that's trying to change, you only have a few chances to get that right, where you, you really have to get the buy-in of a small group to actually test it. So then when it's rolled out, the benefit is immediately seen. If the first group of users to a product see failure, then you don't get, I think there was someone Absolutely. who showed, you don't get those early adopters, right? So I think that's one learning we've had. Yeah, that's what kind of Usha mentioned before yeah. on stage. Yeah. Augustine, something from your side, from yeah, I experience. Think the, I think that the mindset within the company is also mm -hmm. super important. So you mentioned like traditional companies um, that maybe have no digital processes. 
that's really important from my point of view that it's driven and from the top. So that, like as men you mentioned in your talk as well, the leadership need to go like ahead. They need to be like the role model and then push it through the company. And then also to refer to Usha today, um, the, the lady from uh, Deford, yeah, keep your users and the customers in mind who like basically uh, need to use the digital services day by day. Get the feedback. They don't tell you the solution, but they, they tell you what suck. And then you need to basically pick it up and, and improve them there the situation um, and then like have like kind of iterative process. Okay, perfect. So let's leave topic number one behind us. You all know that we have two focus points this year with shift mobility um, and the second one is sustainability. As all of you are working day by day on the future of logistics, I want to know from you if that makes logistics more sustainable in the future. Um, yeah, so I'm going to ask you straight away, does digitizing the supply chain automatically make it more sustainable? Well, I think for sure it will. Um, and, and one of the things what you see is that with digitization, and I think you're working more I on I should that. have put in a where in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but one of the core points is that um, it allows you to, what does digital do or digitization? It allows you to optimize your capacity. It's a core point in it within the company, but also if you work with multiple companies. So if you have a, have a truck driving from one point to a second point, you want to make sure it's filled. It's not, and, and there are still trucks that, that are not completely filled because it's only working for one company doing one job. So there's, there's a lot to do there. If we get that going very well, I think that we, we, can, we can do actually much more with the current logistics infrastructure that we have. Hmm. That's same to you. Not only does it, but where does I think it does, and I think it goes back to some of the points you've heard about, always think about the customer. So in, in our, where we work, we're, we're a service provider, and if you look at it, if, you, if you, our clients are creating a product for their customer, and on the face of it, supply chain seems very, very far away from that. Mm -hmm. But if I speak to, our if I speak to a C CEO of one of our clients, they will tell us this is what our customers want, and even our employees. Like, We've heard from our clients that in interviews, the younger generation are actually asking those questions. What are you doing? So then that filters its way through our clients all the way down to supply chain. So when we offer a platform that allows them to show, well, oh, you moved more on air freight and you could maybe move more on ocean freight to save uh, on, on CO2, or you can even offset those. So it's, it's really, it's, it's everything is customer first and we, we are just a part of that. So I think it's definitely going to drive it, but it's, I don't see that this is something that we're pushing on our customers. It's our customers' customers that require that, and it's, it's going all the way through to the, to the supply chain as well. Perfect. Augustine, you want to add something? Yeah, I think it's uh, like key part is transparency. That if you have like through digitalization, the transparency of all your like processes, where like the, the, the stuff is, etc., you can then optimize it. And then as, as already mentioned, you can then optimize like the routes. We can also optimize the, the vehicle type. So maybe you don't need a big truck to go in the city. Maybe it's then based on the data you have, you can do it with like a cargo bike, etc. This will have then also like impacts on sustainability. Um, I think there are a lot of areas where we, we can have like impact there. Um, yeah, we just need to figure it out and make more progress. Perfect. So whenever we are talking about the future of mobility, we're automatically talking about autonomous driving. So how does autonomous driving influence or impact uh, a more sustainable transportation? Yeah, I, f I find it interesting. And, and uh, you already mentioned, uh, for example, where are the first points for autonomous driving, like last mile and, and long. Yeah. And I, w what the interesting point of that is that if you look at the concept, um, and you still have somebody in the car, it basically changed the job of the person, mm -hmm. right? So you, you are now a professional driver, but, but your driving is maybe not the first point anymore that you're doing, but you're still in the car and you're at work. So what do you become? Um, and, and basically you could say, for example, you become a service agent because you're there, you come with the luck, you go to a customer, make sure everything goes well. And while you're, where you're in, in the truck or in your van, you do admin work or other stuff that you do. And by doing that, I think what you get is that you much more, you, you, you could even have a scenario where you re reduce offices. We already have the scenario at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, but you can say, well, let's, there's no office in you know, because your, your vehicle becomes your office, right? Mm -hmm. And by, by doing that, I think autonomous driving can have a very big impact on, 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 on how we work. Uh, and it's not just about the vehicles, it's about what happens to the office. Maybe we don't need office space anymore. Imagine the sustainable impact of that. Or, um, uh, uh, an office is actually your car, so you can actually be there everywhere. You don't need to drive there anymore. So I think there is a lot of change doing that. On the other side, it could also increase 
the overall productivity. And overall productivity, if you increase and increase that, also you could have the downside that in the end, yeah, it will, it will cost and also have, have an impact on sustainability as well. Yeah. And maybe you can also like extend the reach and like use autonomous vehicles, different types and different sizes to go in areas where you haven't been with like your people transport or um, with your logistics van because it, it's not worthwhile to go there with like a driver in a car, but maybe you can send an autonomous vehicle there. That's then also like you add in more, um, yeah, a bigger audience get access to then the transportation network. You have then also like sustainability aspects on the social side there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Doc, you want to add something? No, I think I think the the interesting point from Taco is like the, this. Yeah, it's just going to change the the way that people work. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, it's this, that's perfect. Big change. So, as I have a quick look over there, we just have 28 seconds left. The last field I want to touch is electric trucks because they are still missing on the streets. We don't see them. I think that's the most of all, impo yeah, a topic because of charging something. But how do you feel? How important will e trucks be? in the future for a real sustainable future of transportation? Your personal opinion. Doug, I start with you. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I think you, someone just showed, I think it was Taco who showed the adoption of technology. And uh, I think the, tr the, the electric truck is probably at the end of the, you know, the, 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 we're talking about the consumer of a, of a car now versus an electric vehicle. I mean, this is something, if we look at it in our, if I'm thinking of it directly applicable to what I work in, how quickly can it get there in terms of those those simple ones that we we talk, talk about line haul, those those familiar um, those familiar trips? It's not it's not the more complex truck that you, maybe we're thinking of going in and around the cities. But I'm thinking like whether it's from a port to a fulfillment center. I don't know. I'd love to know how far away we are from that. Um, I'd love Taco to actually share on that. Yeah. Well, I think I mean in the end. I think you, we g will not get around it. So in, in yeah. order to, to make our sustainability objectives, yeah. we all need to go electric, maybe hydrogen, all the other ways, but we need to go away from the combustion engine. I think there's no discussion about it. So there's actually no option. And I think, I think, I think it will happen. It will happen and, and the technology will adapt. People will adapt to it. Electric vehicles, they will adapt. Um, I think but what we'll see particularly already is that, that there's a lot of let's say, local distribution networks. So the local distribution, they will, they will adapt very much. Uh, a distribution center will get a new, a new role. And you get maybe like, uh, and there's scenarios where you have a cities where there's, there's a distribution, it's like an airport, it's a big logistics center before you go into the city. And then maybe you have autonomous driving vehicles that go into the city. Uh, but you don't need to have your current thinking anymore. It, it will be, I think, here at, at all together, we we agile enough, and we have all these new startups coming, and they will lead us mm. in in what we need to do. It will take a bit of time, but I think it will happen. Yeah. You're really lucky that time is up, because otherwise I would have asked you to put out your crystal ball and uh, pretend how long it will take in the future until <laughs> <laughs> we see the e-tracks on the on the road. Augustin, just the last sentence from your side about yeah, it. Yeah, so I, I want to add there. I think that. There's no, no other option than electrify it, and we will see kind of dismantling of the truck and maybe fragmentation. Yeah, in the past, there was maybe a truck and a delivery van, but in the future, we will have then like smaller electric vehicles like that are more appropriate to doing the job, like cargo bikes or like uh, small electric vehicles for like um, deliveries, etc. And I think that we will have like the whole transition of like the, the engine, the vehicle types, and also the network, the infrastructure we have to basically combine and everything. Perfect. Then Thank you very much, Doug Taco. Obviously, it was a pleasure to have you here. I think this is your round of applause. And I would have loved to talk with you for ages now. <laughs> so thanks a lot for being with us and sharing your insights with us. Perfect. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.